Thank you. Um, so in contrast to my previous two lectures I gave where I was really trying to review historical material about superradiance and Medici model, what I'm going to do in this last talk is to bring this up to date and I'm going to talk about recent work that we've been doing in this context and particularly about e expanding some of these ideas of superradiance transitions and collective behavior to the physics in multi-mode optical cavities. And so, so that's what I'm going to be talking about. Um, but as I promised in the first lecture, I said I was no good at drawing maps, so I would wait until this point to show you what and where St. Andrews is. So, so this is St. Andrews, and as you can see, it lives on the coast. It's up in Scotland, so in the north of the UK. And if I zoom in on Scotland, it's sticking out here onto the North Sea. And um, from this aerial view, you can see that it has the ruins of a castle and over here the ruins of a cathedral and then there's a medieval university buildings in the middle of town and the physics department is hidden somewhere off the top of this building and just off here there is a rather famous golf course which every so often takes over the whole town. So um, let, let me now turn back to just to remind you what I said at the end of the last lecture about cold atoms in optical cavities and the ability to to, um, to realize an effective um, Rabi, um, an effective matter-like coupling um, via a Raman process. And I, I, I want to call this kind of idea, this idea of using Raman driving to control the matter-like coupling, a sort of form of synthetic cavity QED in the sense that you have control over the effective parameters. And a lot of what, what, what we've done in this area is building on this idea of what things do you now have control over because of the fact that you can tune this matter-like coupling. And as we said in the last lecture, um, you can have this set up with a cavity and a pump beam that produces an effective um, Tavis Cummings coupling or you can go to the case where you have two legs to this transition and produce an effective Dickey model where you then have processes which create excitations and therefore can beat the lost processes that a real cavity will have. And what I want to really talk about in, in this, um, this talk is to combine that idea of synthetic cavity QED with the idea of multi-mode cavity QED, so a setup where you have multiple cavity modes and multiple atoms and then coupling between those many atoms and many, many cavity modes and then look at the open system dynamics of this system with losses either just of photons or in some cases I'll also talk about losses coming from the atomic part and to explore the fact that in this kind of setup as well as talking about whether you have just strong coupling in the sense of coupling strength being large compared to line widths, or ultra-strong coupling in the sense of it being large compared to the bare frequencies, you can also ask questions of what new physics shows up when the coupling strength is large compared to the bandwidth, so that the matter-like coupling starts to mix together many cavity modes and pick out new particular quasi-modes that are, are important for describing the physics of this problem. And the context I'm going to be talking about that in, and I'll say more about this later on, is that of confocal cavities. Cavities where you make the length of the cavity equal to or almost equal to the radius of curvature. And you can look at this in two ways. You can look at this in a ray tracing picture that says at the confocal point you get this hourglass shape of, of closed orbits. Um, but you can also look at it in terms of actual um, the, the basis functions in a cavity, the different transverse modes, and seeing that what happens at the confocal point is that there are resonances between transverse modes coming from different longitudinal families. So that, for instance, the, um, the zero, zero mode of one family becomes resonant with the two, zero mode of a different family, and at the confocal point, where, when L is equal to R, you get a pileup of many modes all at the same frequency, and these resonances, they occur at, um, but both at the same spacing that you would have got between the basic longitudinal modes and also at half that spacing. And that's because these families are split into odd and even families. There, there are families which include the zero, zero mode of one longitudinal family in resonance with zero, two, one, one, and two, zero. But there are also um, points in between this which contain resonances between zero, one, one, zero, 1, 2, um, 2, 1, 3, 0, etc. So, so where the overall modes are odd or even. And 
Um, the experiments I'm going to talk about later on in this talk involve um, a cavity where you can tune the length of the mirrors while being compatible with ultra-high vacuum. And with that, you can then tune between a regime where the mirror is not quite at the right distance and you see different um, even families which are not exactly degenerate. And then when you go to the confocal point, all of these different mode resonances all pile up at the same point. And then you start to see physics from competition between these different modes, rather than seeing that the different frequencies pick out different modes. So, so, so that's the, the direction I want to go in. Um, what I'm going to do overall in, whoops, sorry, it's gone forward too fast. Um, I don't know quite why it jumped there. Right. Um, yeah, so that's what I want to, to, to do. Um, what I'm going to do overall in this talk is to first talk a bit more about um, strong coupling between light in a cavity and atomic density waves. And I mentioned this right at the end of the last lecture, the idea that you could realize this Dickey model where you weren't talking about transitions between two internal states of the atoms, but two different momentum states. And I'm going to call that a density wave polariton in the sense that what you have here is hybridization, strong coupling between light in the cavity and a density excitation of the atoms. And I'll talk about that first in the single mode cavity to, to give slightly more review of what, what is expected and what's been seen experimentally. And then to go on to um, what happens in multi-mode cavities, first in the non-degenerate case and then in the degenerate case. Then I'll talk a bit about other physics you can do with multi-mode cavities where you use internal states of the atom rather than momentum states. And at the end, I'll talk about something which is slightly different, which is using the idea of internal states of atoms and multi-mode cavities to produce um, a, a way of realizing a kind of Meissner-like effect for cold atoms in an optical cavity. Okay, so th this is really just summarizing the, the same kind of picture that we talked about in the last lecture of saying that you can have transitions from a low-lying two-level system via excited states, but now writing it in terms of the two states being atoms at rest and atoms in this particular stand, um, standing wave pattern. Um, in the last lecture, I talked about this in terms of momentum states, saying that you have momentum Q in the cavity direction and momentum Q in the pump direction. And now I've just written this wave function in real space. And this will realize an, a form of a Dickey model, as we discussed last time. But there's an extra term that shows up. Um, and it shows up in a slightly more complicated way when you think about momentum states because you actually have to worry also about transitions to higher momentum states. And the net result of that is there is always this term present that gives you an effective shift of cavity frequency dependent on the state of the atoms. Um, and, whoops, skipped forward. Okay, sorry. Um, so so um, the, the comment I just wanted to, to finish with on this slide was to say, um, in this phase, so in this system, you can have a phase transition to a superradiant state, as we discussed in the last lectures. And it's worth pointing out that this superradiant state will break a symmetry of this problem. Um, it will break a symmetry in that it will choose what phase the light in the cavity has. And there is a twofold choice of what phase the light in the cavity has. That twofold choice of a phase of light is also in this density wave picture directly associated with what spatial pattern the atoms adopt. So one phase of light will mean that the atoms sit on this kind of set of sites of a checkerboard, and the other phase of light will mean they can sit on the other set of sites. And you can also think of this phase transition in this context as actually coming about because if atoms are sitting on these sites of a checkerboard lattice um, coming from interference between the pump and the cavity beams, then they will scatter, they will brag scatter light because of these diagonal planes and that will scatter light from the pump into the cavity. And that will happen no matter whether it's this pattern or this pattern. And what you can think the phase transition corresponds to is the condition where the scattering of light into the cavity beats any loss of light out of the cavity. And so you have this self-sustained density wave pattern of atoms coexisting with light in the cavity, whereas below the phase transition, light leaks out of the cavity or, or the light that you're scattering in is too far off resonance, and therefore you don't get light in the cavity and you don't get this density wave. 
if, if I look at um, what happens to the phase diagram of this problem, when I take into account the fact that there are cavity losses and take into account the fact that there is this extra term u, this shift of cavity frequency, there's a couple of interesting things to note. So if I ignore u first and just look at the theoretical phase diagram of this problem with losses, there are two changes. What one I actually mentioned last time is this phase boundary acquires a uh, a nose, it acquires a minimum value of g that you require in, each, in order to beat the loss. If, if g was not present, this, um, this line would come in to zero, which would say if you were exactly at resonance, if the cavity and pump frequency matched, you could get a phase transition for arbitrarily small g. But in the presence of loss, you need to have some critical g, some critical pumping, in order to balance the cavity losses. The other notable feature here, um, which has some complication for the density problem, but if you just think of the effective Dickey model, it, it definitely exists, is that there is a regime where the stable state of this dissipative system is to invert all of the two-level systems. And actually, you can directly relate this to the, 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 um, the work we heard about yesterday from Jens Koch, where you can make a mapping in this problem between h and minus h and swap all the upspins to downspins and you can understand that this inverted state down here is exactly a consequence of swapping the sign of frequency and using this is mapping between density matrix and its complex conjugate as you invert this parameter so so this is what happens when u is equal to zero if I turn on this feedback term u, actually you can understand fairly clearly what will happen. Because what u will do is shift the cavity frequency dependent on the state of the atoms. And there's two states of the atoms here in the normal state. One is down, one is up. So some of these boundaries will shift down and some of them will shift up. And what you'll get is there starts to be a region where there is coexistence, where there's more than one attractor of the dynamics. And so you get a complicated phase diagram because of these overlaps of different regions. There's also a slight subtlety that a new phase shows up, which is a, a different kind of superradiance, one where the light in the cavity ends up exactly pi by two out of phase with the pump. Um, but the more interesting thing that occurs is what happens if you change U the opposite sign, so experimentally, u is negative, but um, as a theorist, I'm allowed to play with a sign of u and see what would happen. And there's a region here where the phase boundaries have pulled apart, and none of the fixed points that I knew about previously existed here. And if you explore what happens there, then actually there's a regime of persistent oscillations. There's a re regime where the photon number never stops oscillating. And this picture I plotted here is on quite a long time scale, so, so actually this filled in region is many oscillations with a fast period and just showing that this oscillation amplitude reaches a steady state value and then never stops. So, so that, that's what you can expect to be possible in general. What's been explored experimentally, I'll just skip that, is um, to look at this phase diagram with cold atoms in um, an optical cavity and map out the phase diagram um, in terms of the pump strength and the cavity frequency. And what you see in this picture is exactly that there is super radiance, there is light in the cavity, that this color scale is measuring the light that actually leaks out of the cavity in exactly the region where you ex would expect super radiance to occur. And this was measured with these momentum state um, two-level systems um, in an experiment by the group of Terman Esslinger back in 2010. These other pictures on the left actually point out that this momentum state picture, because you can understand it in a quite different way in terms of Bragg scattering of light, doesn't really require a um, Bose condensate of atoms at all. And this has been measured actually back in 2003 by the group of Vlad and Vuletic using a thermal gas and seeing this same kind of self-organization. Here, what they were showing is just the fact that there are two phases of light in the cavity that one may see, and shot to shot, there is a different value of this phase of light. And this momentum space picture, um, not in terms of the Dickey model, but just in terms of Bragg scattering, was actually discussed back in 2002 by Helmut Rich. Um, since this point, there have been other experiments that have seen the same kind of momentum space realization of the Dickey model um, by the group of Andreas Hemerick in Hamburg, and also a realization in terms of two different internal states of the atoms in a single mode cavity 
um, by the group of Murray Barrett in Singapore. So this is really realizing exactly the idea proposed by, by Daimler and Carmichael um, back in 2007. Okay, so, so this is all in a single mode cavity. What I want to, to really focus on in this talk is the possibilities that come when you go beyond a single mode cavity and you go to multi-mode cavities. And, and actually, just to, to highlight what kind of range of possibilities there are, you can engineer different forms of multi-mode cavities, different patterns of which modes are degenerate. Um, as I've already mentioned, you can have realizations of the Dickey model either with momentum states or with different internal hyperfine states of the atoms. Um, we already pointed out that um, if you have separate addressability of these transitions, you can engineer the Dickey model, um, which is a kind of icing-like coupling in the sense that it only has a phase degree of freedom, uh, only has a um, sign degree of freedom for the light in the cavity. But you can also engineer the number-conserving Tavis Cummings model, which has a kind of XY symmetry. Um, or um, you can engineer anything in between those. And also you can do this kind of experiment with a thermal gas or with a BEC or with disorder localized atoms or with a degenerate Fermi gas. And once you take the combinations of all of the sets of things on this slide, you see there's really quite a, a rich variety of different things you can build in this kind of setup, different kind of cavity mediated phases. What I'm going to talk about next is what can you do with the, the um, density wave, the momentum wave realization in a multi-mode cavity. And I'm going to talk first about what do you see in a case where the, there are multiple cavity modes, but they're not degenerate. But when I say not degenerate, what I really mean is that not all the modes are degenerate. If I look at this case where the modes are resolved, the zero zero mode is non-degenerate, but if I go here to the second order family, it's not degenerate with the zero family, but here there are the two zero, one one, and zero two modes of the cavity. And those are degenerate, or very nearly degenerate up to some astigmatism. And so I have a kind of controllable degeneracy in that this family is one fold, this is three fold, this is five fold, this is seven fold. And so you can look at different families here and start to understand what the different amounts of degeneracy do to the behavior of the superradiance transition. And what this picture at the bottom is showing is if you pump with a pump frequency here somewhere near this cavity frequency, then what you see is superradiant light coming out in the zero zero mode of the cavity. And this is all straightforward. But if I choose to pump at these frequencies, what you instead see is as you go through this set of frequencies, the spatial pattern of the light that comes out varies, and it varies because you're starting to remix these different cavity modes in order to produce the superradiant pattern that the, the light adopts. And because these modes are nearly degenerate, what you find is actually that the pattern of light you are seeing here is not the bare transmission that you would see through these different cavity resonances. What you actually see is that the pattern of light that comes out here is strongly dependent on exactly where the atoms are sitting and what shape the atom cloud is, because it depends on what pattern of, or what superposition of cavity modes does the light matter scattering couple to most strongly. And, and this is perhaps rather complicated to see in this, this um, sevenfold degenerate family here, but it's very easy to see if I look at the lowest order odd family. So if I look at the zero, one, and one, zero modes, what you can do is by moving the pattern, by moving the cloud of atoms either to position one or position two or three, you can control different superradiant patterns of light. Um, what you have here is a cavity where, due to some astigmatism, actually the bare cavity modes would be this and this. But if you put the atoms off center, it produces a superposition of those modes and there is superradiance into that superposition. Because when the atoms are off center in this one direction, that will only couple to light which has light in this off diagonal direction. If you put the atoms in the middle of a cloud, then you don't really see superradiance with this family because they're not overlapping with where the light is. What you can also see is that as well as the position of the atoms changing which pattern of light is selected, the pattern of light that you see superradiance in changes the properties of the atoms in the superradiant state. And the easiest way to think about this is to say, well, if I now have this um, 
this transverse pattern of light, then rather than just having this simple two-component um, wave function, I now have some envelope functions for what the atoms are doing. And when I take a zero, zero mode of a cavity, these envelope functions are fairly smooth. And if I just do a time of flight image, what you see in this pattern, these four brag spots are just this cosine Q, QZ, cosine QY. The other brag spots here are actually from the strong pump lattice producing extra higher order terms in, in the pump direction. But when you have a zero, one mode of a cavity going super radiant, what you start to see is these Bragg spots acquire a structure factor that they divide up into two blobs, and those two blobs are precisely telling you about the fact that the light in the cavity changes sign in the middle, and so this checkerboard of what pattern the atoms are in also changes sign in the middle. There is some envelope to this psi up of R, and this envelope which goes through a node gives you a structure factor which you can see in the time of flight image of the atoms. Okay, so, so that's all what happens in the case where the cavity is um, in the limit that different families are not degenerate with each other. What I want to switch to now is what happens as we go towards the fully degenerate limit. And I, I can show this first in terms of these real space images, and I'll then go on to show, show something more interesting coming out of that. But what, what I should notice in, in the confocal cavity when I really go to the degenerate limit is that if I sum together all possible cavity modes, because all possible really means either all even modes or all odd modes, in either case, the light intensity is symmetric. But if I put a cloud of atoms here, it will couple to light in the cavity which will have a symmetric profile. There'll be some light here and some light up here. And so if you look at the light that comes out of the cavity in the superradian state, um, when the atoms in the middle, you see one blob. But when you move the atoms off center, you start to see two blobs. One is the light that's coming out directly from the atoms, and the other is coming out after tracing out this hourglass and then coming out at the opposite side, um, a, mirror image in the, um, a mirror image in the cavity in this, in this axis. Just, just for contrast, here is what you would have had if I looked at the single mode cavity. So if you detune from resonance and do exactly the same experiment, what you see here is always one Gaussian blob, and when you move the atoms off center, it gets weaker. Whereas here you see this, this pattern which basically says that the light is able to match whatever shape and pattern of atoms you put in up to the fact that it symmetrizes it. And you can even take the atoms way off, off the center of the cavity, um, so a point that will be way outside the beam waste of the zero, zero mode, and still see these two blobs. Um, this scale bar is what would be the beam waste of the zero, zero mode. So, so one thing which is not so visible on this picture is that as you move these atoms off center, the threshold for reaching this superradiant state changes. And the change of this threshold is quite interesting because you can measure how does the threshold change as a function of where you put the atom cloud. And this is first in a picture here, which is still pretty much um, single mode behavior. And what you see in this picture is something that's not that far off being a Gaussian. And this Gaussian is telling you that when you move the atoms away from the, the center of the zero, zero mode, then they won't couple so strongly. And you will see this um, fall off of how well they couple and therefore an increase of how large the pumping has to be to reach superradiance. But when you go towards the degenerate case, so, so when you're up in this region where all the modes are sitting on top of each other, you still see there is some um, sharp change of how the threshold behaves on position. But what this is really telling you about is that when the atoms are in the middle of the cavity, the image of the atoms and their mirror image sits on top of each other and you get constructive interference between these, and this gives you a twofold increase in, in the effective coupling strength, and therefore there's a basic factor of two between these, these two peaks, it's not quite exact. And this falls off as you put the, pull the clouds apart on a length scale that is much shorter than the cavity waste. And it's actually in this, this last picture here, it's at a length scale that's really just controlled by how big our atom cloud is, but in principle, if you had very narrow atom clouds, you can see that this, this um, fall off of this um, threshold matches a formula that looks like this. And what this formula tells you is there is a parameter m star that is controlled by 
the ratio between the detuning of the pump from the lowest order cavity mode, so delta naught is this detuning, and epsilon is what is the splitting between different mode families. And as you go to the degenerate point, this M star diverges. And what that gives you is a kind of length scale over which this interaction between the cloud and its mirror image falls off. And so one way to understand what, what you have here is an effective tunable range interaction between atoms mediated by the cavity. And you can tune this range um, from scales of the beam waste right down to effectively zero length scale. Um, if you make the system fully degenerate, this M star goes to infinity, and the length scale appearing in here goes to zero. You can also understand this M star as roughly telling you how many different transverse cavity modes are involved in this pattern. In fact, if you take um, a, a different formula for what would be the threshold behavior as a function of a cavity where you threw away the high order modes, you get a very similar result, although not quite identical. So, so what this is really showing is that this multi-mode cavity allows you to have a controllable range cavity-mediated atom-atom interaction. And so this gives you a new tool in terms of um, um, cold atom physics that you ha can have interactions which don't just have short-range parts or don't just have a fixed power law interaction, but really have something you can tune up what value you would like. So I've shown this here just in terms of a single cloud of atoms. In order to really show this is an atom-atom interaction, you can also repeat the experiment with two clouds of atoms, now placed on opposite sides of the cavity, and what you can start to see is interactions between one cloud and the mirror image of the other. And really, there's no difference between the cloud and its mirror image. And so what you see here is the clouds are off-center but are on top of each other, whereas here the clouds are both off-center and not on top of each other. And so when they're not on top of each other, you see four blobs, um, each cloud and its mirror image. Here you see one cloud and its mirror image, and the other cloud and its mirror image all, all lying on top of each other. And again, you see that the thresholds um, shift so that there is this increased interaction when the atoms are sitting on top of the mirror image of the other cloud. Um, Actually, there's a, there's a complication that's hidden in that picture, and it's hidden because the color scale um, was chosen so that you just saw the main features. If you really look at what the atom-atom interaction is, there are four parts of this, or, or three parts. Um, there is the interaction of atoms with themselves, there's an interaction of atoms with their mirror image, and then there's another part which shows up in this um, confocal cavity geometry, which has an interesting part, um, form. It has a cosine x dot x prime part. And so there's a long range background part, and this comes for three in a confocal cavity. And actually, if you um, saturate the color scale and look at the light that's coming out, you see there are fringes in between these, and the fringe spacing that you see is set by the position of where the atoms are. And this is an experimental picture, this is the theory picture from the full result. And what's, what's great about this, um, this form of interaction is it says if you can avoid being dominated by the short range interactions, you have a kind of analog of RKKY type interactions between atoms that has this sign changing form and you can in, induce frustrated interactions between atoms at different points in this cavity. And you, you can actually directly understand what this pattern is that you're seeing here from the full wave picture that corresponds to the ray tracing hourglass. The, the ray tracing hourglass picture gives you lines like this. And actually what you find is, there is a, there's an expanding wave that comes out of here. There's a wave that goes across the middle. And what you get in the middle here is interference between the different parts of these rays. And this gives you this cosine x dot x prime term. Okay. So, so that's um, all that I wanted to say about the density wave case. Um, I'm going to say I'm going to skip um, through this next part quite quickly. Um, I really want to just say, say, mention one thing about um, what happens if you think about spin states of the atoms rather than density states, and that's just to say that this does allow a whole possibility of exploring different kinds of spin glass models or um, different spin-spin interaction models, particularly taking into account what I've just told you about what the confocal cavity really gives you. You have these sign-changing interactions, and then you can start to say, what interesting physics is there in the spin glass um, realization of this multi-mode cavity? One, one question which also comes up in that context is if you're 
if you're looking at these models, what are the effects of losses on these kinds of phase transitions? And I, I just want to mention very briefly, and then go on to my final part, um, some work that we've done looking at what happens if you worry about not just cavity losses, but also losses in terms of changing the state of a two-level system, or in terms of dephasing of a two-level system. And that this work was really motivated by some work by Emanuele Della Torre uh, and co-authors, which came up with a result which, which surprised us, because we, it, it contradicts the things we knew from, from previous work. And it turns out there's a rather subtle behavior that occurs here, particularly in a limit where you have dephasing, but not loss. Because if you have dephasing but not loss, what you find is there is always a critical coupling strength G where the normal state goes unstable and you might think you get a superradiant state. But if there is dephasing and no loss, you can't find that superradiant solution. If you try and solve these equations of motion and find what the superradiant state is, there, there isn't one. There, there's no way to satisfy the equations of motion. And um, there's an answer that comes out of mean field theory, which looks a little strange at first, which says that the resolution of this is that, in mean field theory at least, when you have just dephasing and no loss, you find that there are many possible normal states. You, you can have more or less any configuration of um, the atoms as long as it's only populations of up and down and no coherences, and that will be fine as a, a steady state solution. And if you go to the fully mixed state, where half the atoms are up and half the atoms are down, then the critical G goes off to infinity. But that fully mixed state never has a phase transition. And so the only sort of resolution of these two that you can come up with is that as you um, drive the system, uh, as you um, increase the dephasing um, and increase the drive for value G to be larger and larger, you will be driven into this fully mixed state. And we wanted to see, is this really true? Is this what happens in the full solution of this problem? But in the full solution of this problem with dephasing, you have the issue that you can no longer replace all the individual two-level systems by a collective giant spin. And the collective giant spin is a useful trick that allows you to simply solve the full quantum dynamics of this problem in, in the case where there's only collective losses. Um, but it turns out that there are, there are methods, and, and there are methods which have been developed by a number of people, that allow you to solve problems like this as long as there is permutation symmetry between the atoms. As long as each atom behaves equivalently, it doesn't matter if the state is if you have, can write a symmetric eigenstate or not. As long as all atoms are equivalent, you can use these tricks to make um, the full simulation of this problem only require polynomial resources. And so we did that and then find um, what's the exact steady state for 30 atoms and plot what's going on by plotting the Wigner function. Now since this is a, so the Wigner function is telling me about the quasi-probability of amplitudes of the photon field, so this is the Wigner function of the photon field in the cavity, and since it's a finite system, there will be no true symmetry breaking, the, the exact solution of any finite size system will respect all of the symmetries of the problem, so I won't see superradiance by breaking the symmetry. What I will see is there are two blobs here, and in the infinite system limit, or if there was a symmetry breaking field, I would see just one of these blobs and there would be a breaking of symmetry, but in the finite system the signature that I'm looking for is these two blobs. And now I can ask what happens if I add loss, I still get two blobs, if I add load, loss and dephasing, I still sort of get two blobs, but if I add just dephasing, I only get one blob, there is no superradiance transition, at least from this simulation. And you can actually go further and you can do finite size scaling of this result and say how does the number of photons in the cavity scale with the number of atoms, and what you find is for three of these conditions it looks like it's going to some finite value, whereas in the case with just dephasing, you do indeed see this seems to be going to zero. And you can really convince yourself this is right by comparing this finite size scaling of the exact solution to a cumulant expansion approach, which is a 1 over n expansion, and that matches very well to these results and really does confirm that in the case of pure dephasing, there is no superradiant solution. Okay, so, so that was a rather fast... Um, 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 review of that, that result about what, what kinds of physics you can explore in the 
spin realizations, and I wanted to go through that fast so that I have some time to talk about this last topic, which is really quite different in spirit to all the things I've been talking about so far, but it's making use of the multi-mode cavity. And it's making use of the multi-mode cavity to, to um, fill in what I think is a gap in other kinds of methods in cold atoms of thinking about synthetic gauge fields or synthetic magnetic fields. And what I mean by synthetic magnetic fields is the idea of, um, that's been proposed in many different schemes, and I'm just talking about one here that I'm going to generalize in a moment by, uh, by Spielman, Spielman from 2009, that says if you have atoms with two internal states and you can couple them by the Raman scheme, what you can do is couple them in such a way that as you go from state A to state B, you get a momentum kick in some direction. Here it's the x direction. And if you take this problem and you project onto its ground state, if you project onto the low energy state in the presence of this Raman beam, what you get is something that looks a bit like a vector potential. You have momentum minus something, and you can call this a vector potential. And why this is useful is if you could make the energy of level A and level B vary in space, then this vector potential will vary in space. And um, if this vector potential varies in space, then there will, could potentially be a curl of that vector potential, and so there could be a magnetic field. And so this allows you to then say, how will neutral atoms respond to this synthetic magnetic field? Although the atoms don't real, really talk to magnetic fields, you can say, how would they behave in a synthetic field, and see how they would rotate, and see how they would flow, etc. But this is a, a step short of really saying, can I use cold atoms to um, look at the synthetic, um, to build a, a simulator of the coupling between charges and a magnetic field. And it's, it's a step short, because here the atoms respond to the magnetic field, but the magnetic field is fixed. But there's nothing that the atoms could do that could change the magnetic field. The magnetic field is just set by the curl of this expression, and this is basically determined by the pattern of lasers you use and whatever it is you use to shift um, the energies of levels A and B. And that's a problem because there's all kinds of interesting physics, like the Meissner effect, the, the expulsion of magnetic field by a superfluid, or the Anderson-Higgs mechanism where the gauge field should acquire an effective mass, or more exotic things like the fact that in two plus one dimensions, QED should have a confinement-deconfinement transition if you were able to um, change the, the um, fine structure constant in a simulated version. And what I want to say is actually multi-mode cavity QED can find a way to at least do one of these and maybe possibly do, do all of these by giving back some dynamics to the magnetic field. And the idea I want to use is actually just take exactly the scheme that we drew before, but make one change. And that one change is that the shift to EA and EB, the thing which will make the effective vector potential vary in space, should come from the light in the cavity. And once you do that, everything follows, because the, the light in the cavity can have some spatial variation. We have a multi-mode cavity, so there can be some spatially varying shape. And the light in the cavity will have some dynamics, but because it's a dynamical degree of freedom, there will be some automatic reciprocity. But if the light in the cavity affects the matter field this way, then the equation of motion for the light will see a source term that is related to the currents in the cavity. And, and you can go through this in, in detail. You can solve what's the equation for um, a two-level atom of states psi A and psi B in terms of light fields in the cavity, and an equation of motion for light field in the cavity. Um, because of these differential shifts here, it will see what's the population difference between modes A and modes B. And if you then look at the low energy expansion of this, if you, if you restrict to the low energy state for the atoms in the same way that gives you an effective vector potential, what you see is that this population difference here exactly depends on the current of the atoms plus a diamagnetic term. And if you go back to how does the Meissner effect work, the Meissner effect work 
works because in a superconductor, the current term is suppressed and you just get the diamagnetic term and that diamagnetic term expels magnetic field. And my, my last slide is just to show that really works. If I have a synthetic magnetic field like this, so this is positive on one side and negative on the other, and it had to be like that because I had to use an even cavity mode and the um, magnetic field depends on spatial gradients, so the best I could do is a, a sign changing but nearly constant magnetic field. This picture is all in the case where I have turned off the feedback of the atoms on the cavity field. If I turn it on, what you see is that the atoms now expel the synthetic magnetic field from the region where the atoms sit. There is a slight complication that the atom cloud changes its shape, but the net result is that exactly where the atoms are now sitting, there is no synthetic magnetic field. You have a Meissner-like effect where the field has been expelled from the cavity. Okay, so, so that's all I want to talk about. I want to um, finish by just doing two things. Um, one, so if the slide is, ah, oh, yes. Um, one is to acknowledge my collaborators on all of this work. So all the experimental work that I've talked about has been done by the group of Benjamin Lev in Stanford, in particular by his former graduate student, Alicia Collar, who is now working with Andrew Houck in Princeton, and the work is being um, continued particularly by um, Varun Vadya, a postdoc um, in Stanford. Um, and on the theory work that I've discussed, the um, a lot of the interpretation of this exper these experiments has been done in collaboration with Kyle Valentine, a postdoc in St. Andrews, who also works on the synthetic ma um, magnetic field and Meissner effect. The work I mentioned very briefly about the Dickey superradiance transition with spin losses was done by another postdoc in St. Andrews, Peter Curtin. Um, and the other thing I wanted to do was to advertise a conference on condensates of light, which will take place next year in, in January um, in Bad Hernhof in Germany. And then I'll put up a reminder of all the things I talked about, and thank you for your attention. Hello. Uh, uh, so uh, in uh, this open Dickey model and this the first first two parts, this light matter coupling is always sort of weak, is it? What what, what do you mean by weak? Uh, like weak uh, compared to the coupling, say, within the, the frequencies of light. Um. Okay, so, so if I go back to this sort of very um, um, first set of slides. Um, um, let, let me just go through, in, 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 in turn, the light matter coupling is tunable because you can change the pump strength. And the kind of maximum values you can reach, they're definitely higher than the loss rates. Um, so. It's strong coupling in that sense, but the collective matter light coupling is larger than loss. Um, they are comparable to the energy splittings between the modes or larger when I go to the degenerate case, so it's strong in that sense. Then in terms of this last set, well, it's definitely much larger than the recoil energies. And then actually when I think about what this omega is, the omega is actually also something I can tune because it was really the pump cavity detuning. And so that can also be made small. So it's strong coupling in respect of all of those things. The only thing that it's not is that it's not large compared to the bare cavity frequency. But in our effective Hamiltonian, the bare cavity frequency never showed up. It was only ever the cavity pump detuning. Uh, so then uh, in this uh, Hamiltonian, I mean, uh, maybe, I mean, there, the, so shouldn't you write down the, the Lindblad operators in terms of some hybrid uh, operators which involve the sort of the diagonal operators of the system have so, so, so that's precisely the point of the one thing which it's not large compared to is the bare cavity frequency. And the, the photon loss out of the cavity will look like a simple Lindblad term, um, or will, will at least be well approximated by it, until you start to get to the regime where the internal coupling strengths are large compared to the optical, the bare optical frequency. So. So there's this scale which never really shows up in the internal Hamiltonian, but is justifying why, um, why it is just bare cavity loss, which is that the cavity frequency is of order 100 terahertz, and everything else is much smaller, but um, it can be strong coupling in terms of those internal scales. But in the steady state which the system reaches is not actually the steady state which you uh, 
get like if you solve it like consistently so so again the loss rate for the limbda process is is reasonably accurate because the frequencies are all small compared to the um, bare cavity frequency and so so the basic picture of this system is yes it's driven and it's a driven dissipative system where photons are leaking out this is quite different to considering a system coupled to a reservoir and the fact that that system and reservoir should come into to equilibrium. In, in this system, so in, in that case where a system is coupled to one bath and should come into thermal equilibrium, once it has reached that, there should be detailed balance, there should be no energy flow between the system and the reservoir. And that, that is not true here um, very demonstrably. Once you reach the steady state, you will pump light in and light will come out. Whoops, I, so, I hope I didn't blind anyone by shining light out of the side of the cavity. Um, but the light that comes out of the side of the cavity really is still coming out. There really is constantly a flow of energy in the system. And so you really shouldn't expect it to reach a detailed balance state of equilibrium with that reservoir, um, at least not until the heat death of the universe when the number of photons outside the cavity is matching those inside. Um, so in that sense, this picture does work in that, that, that limit. It, um, it does reach a steady state. Um, the equation of motion do reach a steady state, and that does accurately match what you see in experiment. But one thing which then also happens in a real experiment is that the atoms die, i.e. the atoms fall out of the, the trap or collide and heat up, and so eventually the experiment finishes because of atom loss. Any other? Yeah. So you mentioned the uh, Messner effect um, in, in the last part of our talk. So uh, in your expression, it looks, looks to me that the, uh, so the field is referred to the uh, matter field, right? So the psi you are, you are showing is a matter field. Um, psi is matter and phi right. is light. So when we talk about the uh, Messner effect in superconductor, usually we refer to the gauge field that gain mass, not to the matter field. Um, so, so actually, um, so, so, so there's many things I can say. Um, on the one hand, let, let me point out that there's the Anderson-Higgs mechanism actually does two things. It gives mass to the gauge field, to the um, electromagnetic field, and it gives mass to the Goldstone mode. So, so the Anderson-Higgs mechanism is complicated because actually two things happen, that two previously massless fields turn out into massive fields. Um, what I should then ask about is, do, does that all work here? So, and, and there's a hierarchy of things you would need to happen in order for all of that to work. So, so um, and we fall really short at the first step in this hierarchy, in that we see field expulsion, but actually nothing was really massless to begin with. Um, and the, the sense is that the light field is not massless primarily because there is photon loss. So, so if I want massless to mean that there is really complete freedom about what the light field should do, I have a problem because the light field is decaying, and so it will always exponentially decay, and there is always going to be a length scale that comes from that. So actually what we see is a Meissner-like effect, um, but there is a much increased expulsion of magnetic field, but it was never really zero before. Um, suppose we could fix that, and, and there are ways you could think about fixing that by having gain to beat loss. Then the next step in the hierarchy you would have is that if you have a massless light field, um, and it couples to matter and it couples in all of this right way, then you will get the, the, the um, gauge field becomes massive. That, that bit would work but actually you won't get the full Anderson-Higgs mechanism um, unless the whole problem had gauge symmetry. So, so the pr process where the, gauge, or the, the, the light field acquires an effective mass is easier to realize than the full Anderson-Higgs mechanism. And the problem is that this, um, this effective coupling here, we can have a gauge-like minimal coupling, but the rest of our action does no, not look like the Maxwell action F mu nu, F mu nu. So until you have all of that, then you don't get the full Anderson-Higgs mechanism. In, in, your, in your gauge, there's no gauge symmetry. So this is just artificial gauge field introduced by the yes, um, imbalance of the yeah. levels. So, so this, there is not a full gauge symmetry. It's not a Maxwell action. Uh, 
Uh, it showed that uh, in the presence of dephasing, uh, there is no phase transition. Does this hold for uh, both the exact decay model and the one with uh, Raman transitions? Because there is a UZ, U and A dagger A coupling that comes in the second case. Um, so you mean in terms of this, um, this thing which shifts the cavity frequency? Uh, um, so we looked at this only in the case of the um, bare Dickey model. I do not know any reason to believe that the U term would restore the phase transition, but we haven't really looked at that. 